you're going to like this chapter because after what you've been through in the last two chapters, it's much simpler. But it's simpler because you have been through the last two chapters. So we're going to take all the learning that we did in um, the last two chapters and change the graph. The aggregate expenditures graph look different than any other kind of graph we've looked at this semester. And we're going to put that information back in a supply and demand graph that looks familiar to us. But we have to be really careful when we do that because although the graph looks familiar and we understand that price is on the vertical and quantities are on the horizontal, it is different because it's aggregate. It's the demand for all of GDP. So it's not the pr a single price, it's the price of all GDP. So think that GDP price index that you calculated, so the price level. And then the horizontal axis is not the quantity of a single product, but the quantity of all GDP. So we just label it with real GDP. Another problem with the aggregate expenditures model that we saw in the last two chapters is that it assumed we were in the immediate short run, which is a time period too short for prices to change. So all of the prices were static, constant. There was no way to see how price level might change when um, consumption or investment or government spending or net exports changed. So we're gonna take that learning and we're gonna put it in a model that's a variable price model and that looks a little bit more familiar to us. So just like we did in chapter three, when we were studying just supply and demand, we're gonna look on the demand side, but now it's aggregate demand. Then we'll look on the supply side, but now aggregate supply. Then we'll put the two together to get our equilibrium price level and GDP. So starting just on the demand side, you know that we said people buy more at lower prices and less at higher prices. That's still true because we have that downward sloping demand curve, but the reasons for it is dif are different. So in chapter three, when we were looking at a single product, the demand curve was based on three aspects. One was the income effect. We said as price level goes down, our income could afford more. The second was the substitution effect. We said as price comes down, we'll substitute out of and now substitute that's relatively more expensive and buy more of this good where price is going down. And then the diminishing marginal utility. We said as we get more and more units of a particular good, each additional unit gives us less and less satisfaction. None of those reasons are applicable here in the aggregate demand model. So that applied to a single product demand curve, but aggregate demand where it's the demand for everything the economy produces, those three reasons will not apply. Instead, we have these three new reasons. So the real balances effect works like a wealth effect. We used to call it wealth effect. I think that's a little clearer. Remember, wealth was not income. It was all our past accumulated income and how we hold our wealth. Some people hold their wealth in real estate. If you own a home, then you're accruing some equity in that home and you're holding your wealth that way. Or perhaps you're invested in mutual funds with your 401ks at work. However it is that you're holding your wealth, if wealth comes down, that affects how much we're going to demand of GDP. If you can think back um, to the Great Recession in 2007, 8, 9, then you'll remember that house prices came down and our 401ks were cut in about half. So when that sort of situation happens, people get nervous and they start buying less stuff. So that's why the aggregate, one of the reasons why the aggregate demand curve slopes downward. Another reason is the interest rate effect. So think about big purchases you might want to buy, like houses or cars or refrigerators, something that you might have to finance instead of pay cash for. Do you care what the interest rate is? Well, sure. We want interest rates to be low when we borrow money so that we won't have to pay as much money back. So on that aggregate demand curve where the vertical axis is price level, 
the price level that we'd be talking about here is the price of borrowing money. So when that price is high, we don't borrow as much. So GDP, it will the equilibrium will be at a lower level. But as interest rates go down, that price level goes down, and then people start borrowing more for houses or cars or refrigerators. And then the last is the foreign purchases effect. So this is other countries, people in other countries buying the goods and services that we produce here, so our exports. If our price level is coming down, it makes sense that foreigners will purchase more of our GDP. So these are the three reasons for that downward sloping aggregate demand curve, and it's different than it was for the single product demand curve. So now we're going to draw the aggregate demand curve and we're going to see that it's downward sloping just like it was for the single product demand curve. But on the vertical axis, we don't have price of a single product. It's price level, like your GDP price index that we calculated back in Chapter 7. And the horizontal axis is not the output or quantity of a certain good. It's the real domestic output, GDP, the quantity of everything we produce in the nation. So then we start thinking about what could shift aggregate demand curve. Do you remember when we shifted the single product demand curve to the right? We were increasing demand for that product. That learning is still going to hold here. If we shift that aggregate demand curve to the right, it means we're going to be perching purchasing more GDP at all possible prices. And we think about, well, what can cause that? Well, anything that causes us to change our aggregate expenditures will shift our aggregate demand curve. If we're spending more, it shifts it to the right. If we're spending less, it shifts it to the left. So remember aggregate expenditures was C plus IG plus G plus XN. So C, that was consumption, household spending, I, and it really should have a subscript G, but investment, capital I was investment, capital G was government, XN is exports minus imports. So if how much households or businesses or government or the amount of exports that we have or imports changes, then that aggregate demand curve will shift to the right or to the left, depending on if we're increasing spending or decreasing it. When we change spending, remember we have the multiplier effect. Remember the multiplier was based on our marginal propensity to consume. So our multiplier was one divided by the NPS, marginal propensity to save. So when we shift spending, the multiplier is gonna kick in and cause that curve to shift even further to the right or even further to the left. So look at the lighter colored aggregate demand one. If we think about, um, let's see, let's, let's lower interest rates. How would you expect lower interest rates to shift this aggregate demand curve? Well, if interest rates go down, households will buy more, right? Buy more houses, buy more cars, anything that they would have to borrow money to purchase. But businesses will buy more capital equipment too. Remember the investment decision? was for the rate of return to be greater than the interest rate. So if interest rates go down, there'll be more projects where the rate of return is greater than the interest rate. So that initial increase in spending shifts that aggregate demand curve to the right. That shows our increase in spending. And then the multiplier kicks in and that shifts our aggregate demand curve even further to the right. So a shift from 81 to 82 is an increase in spending and then the multiplier effect. So let's think about what could cause 81 to go to 83. What could cause a decrease in spending? Well, anything that affects consumption, investment, government, or net exports. So we could think about, um, let's see, what if, let's see, the investment curve was dependent on things like acquisition, maintenance, and operating cost, or change in resource prices. Do you remember all of that? So we think about something that affects investment negatively would shift that curve to the left. Something that affects consumer spending negatively would shift that curve to the left. 
let's just think about ex expectations on households and businesses. What if people get worried about a coming recession? Do you think they spend more or would they spend less? Well, if we're worried about a coming recession, we're gonna spend less. So that's gonna shift our aggregate demand curve leftward and then that same multiplier effect is going to kick in. So here's a list. You've already seen these lists, so we really don't have to do this again because we did this. This particular list was in chapter 10 and we'll see things that affect household spending. That was in chapter 10. Things that affected investment spending was in chapter 11 and then government and net exports were also in chapter 11. So we have seen this before. So anything that affects consumer wealth Household borrowing, consumer expectations, or even our personal taxes change how much households can spend, right? If our taxes go up, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think it's a really bad thing when my taxes go up. So if I redraw that um, aggregate demand curve, remember we had price level on the vertical axis and we have GDP down here on the horizontal axis. Remember the aggregate demand curve was downward sloping, so I'm gonna label this a D1. So now as I draw this new AD2 curve, shifting this to the shifting the aggregate demand curve to the right, is that an increase or a decrease in spending? Well, it's gonna be an increase, right? So what if these things could change that would cause that increase in spending? Would consumer wealth be going up or down? Well, we'd have to be wealthier if we're trying to increase our spending. Household borrowing, would we be borrowing or would we be paying back? Well, if we're increasing spending, we must be in the borrowing phase. Would we expect be expecting a recession or would we, would we be expecting a really good economy where people have jobs and that we're moving forward? We'd be expecting something good. Would our taxes be going up or would our taxes be going down? Well, if we're gonna spend more, it must be that our taxes are going down. So if instead of moving to AD2, it moves leftward to AD3, then just the opposite of everything we said would be true here. Household wealth must be going down or we'd be paying back our debt rather than going into more debt would be expecting a recession and our personal taxes would be going up. So we looked at this real specifically here with consumer spending. It could be a change in consumer spending, but it also could be a change in one of the other components of aggregate expenditures. It could be consumer spending, business spending, government spending, or net exports. So this is the same thing, but with respect to investment spending. So we could draw that graph again and put price level here. Do you remember what went on the horizontal, right? GDP, do you remember the shape of the aggregate demand curve? Downward sloping, yep. So let's do, this one is number one. So real interest rates. So if interest rates are going up, which way would we shift aggregate demand? Well, if interest rates were going up, we'd be shifting aggregate demand to the left, right? Interest rates were going down, would be shifting it to the right. So expected rates of returns would also affect how much investments, how much business is invested. So remember, we only invest if the rate of return is greater than the interest rate. So if rates of return change, it affects how much we're going to be investing. So let's say that, and you've seen this whole list back in chapter 10, so we don't spend, need to spend a lot of time here. But let's say that business's expectation about future business conditions, what if their expectations are that we're going into a recession? Which way would you expect the aggregate demand curve to shift? Well, you would expect it to shift back here, right? that's a decrease. What if business taxes are going down? What if business taxes are going down? Well, right, we'd expect the aggregate demand to shift to the right. So it could be a change in government spending. I'm not gonna draw the graph for you again, but it's the same concept. What if government spending 
is changing because we were going into a war. And so government really ramped up spending with respect to preparing for war goods. Well, then that would shift the aggregate demand to the right. Yes, in peace times, it might shift back to the left. Maybe perhaps there'd be less military spending. And then that last one is net export spending. And we talked about this in our last chapter. So if our trading partners, uh, people who normally buy a lot of our exports, if they're experiencing prosperity and their economies are good, then they're going to buy more of our stuff and our aggregate demand will shift to the right. If they're experiencing recession, then they buy less of their stuff and less of our stuff. And so that aggregate demand curve would be shifting to the left. We also talked about what would happen if exchange rates change. So last time we did dollar appreciation, let's do depreciation. So if the dollar depreciates against a certain nation's currency, then that means we can't buy as much of their stuff, but they could buy more of our stuff. So if they can buy more of our stuff, our exports would go up. Our imports from them would go down, but our exports would go up. And when imports go down and exports go up, that shifts our aggregate demand curve to the right. So just like we did in chapter three, first we looked at, at demand, now we're going to look at supply. But this is aggregate supply, the supply of all GDP. Well, aggregate supply is very dependent on time, what time frame we're in. So we just kind of need to memorize these differences, these definitions here. The immediate short run is a time period too short to be able to change any of our resources. Price levels are going to be fixed in the immediate short run. It's just a time period too short to be able to make changes. We don't really work in the immediate short run. We work all the time in the short run. There's an old quote by John Maynard Keynes. Remember that we're in Keynesian economics right now. And John Maynard Keynes said, we're going to stay in the short run as we study this topic because in the long run, we'll all be dead. He kind of felt that way, that we never actually got to long run conditions because as soon as you would get there, circumstances, things would change and you'd just be in a new short run world. So we're going to focus on the short run. In the short run, we can change some of our resources, but we can't change all of them. So when we look at these topics, we're really just going to talk about labor and capital. It's always about labor and capital. In the short run, it's easy to change our labor. We can ask people to work overtime, or we could hire more people, or we could lay people off. Labor is pretty easy to change, pretty quick. Capital, on the other hand, is not. Remember, capital is all of the manufactured aids that we need to produce our good or service. So it's not people and it's not natural resources. So when we talk about capital being very slow to change, we're typically talking about the physical workspace. So think about the building itself that you're in. So in the short run, labor can change, but capital won't change in the short run. Technology doesn't typically change in the short run. It takes a while to develop that new technology. In the long run, everything can change. So in the long run, we can change all land, all labor, all capital. There is no restrictions in the long run. Think about starting your business and you um, rent your building and you have to sign a contract for that. So you might have rented your building, you might have a contract for five years. If that's the case, then you are in your short run until that contract expires. So it might be five years before you can reach a long run condition where you could get out of that contract. So here's a graph of the aggregate supply curve in the immediate short run. We're not going to use this one, so you don't have to give it a lot of thought, but price level is on the vertical, GDP is on the horizontal. And notice that the short run is a time period too short to change prices. So we could change our labor and affect how much we produce, but we can't change the price level. This is not the graph I want you to concentrate on. This is the graph that I want you to concentrate on. So we're gonna stay focused 
on the short run for our entire course. So in the short run, as you increase output, notice that the price level goes up. I actually want you to extend this um, supply curve to the horizontal axis. Pretend I drew that as a nice straight line. That one's a little better. So down here in the horizontal region, this region just right here, as we increase output, notice that prices do not go up. As we increase output, prices do not go up. And then in the upward sloping region, this region of the original curve, in the upward sloping region, as we increase output, prices do go up. And then in the vertical region, go ahead and extend this curve. I wish I could draw it straight up. Pretend I'm drawing it straight up. You're going to have to really pretend because that is hard to do with the mouse. So in that vertical region of the aggregate supply curve, notice that if demand kept increasing and we wanted to produce more and more of this good, the only effect it would have would be on price. We are absolutely at capacity. We can't produce any more in that vertical region, so increases in demand just cause price level to go up. Notice that we're always told where full employment is. So when you see this QF, you know that that's the level of full employment. So we want aggregate demand. Oh, that's really bad. Let me try this. So we want aggregate demand to intersect right there at that full employment. That's the goal. We want aggregate demand to intersect aggregate supply at full employment. The full employment is the level of GDP that is enough to generate enough jobs to get us fully employed. That's where we want to be. Think about if we were at a low level of aggregate demand, somewhere down here. Well, this aggregate demand is always going to be recessionary because it's not enough spending to get everybody jobs. So anywhere to the left of the full employment intersection spot here, anywhere left of here, is going to be recessionary. That means we need to be able to increase spending to try to get this aggregate demand to shift towards full employment. But what if our aggregate demand curve was way up here? So if our aggregate demand curve is to the right of the full employment level, anywhere to the right of the full employment level, then we're going to be expecting inflation. So we have an inflationary aggregate demand curve. And the goal is going to be to shift it left to get it to come back down to full employment level. Notice if that if that happened, notice how far the price level would drop, and that would be the goal to control inflation. So here's our aggregate supply curve in the long run. Now we said we're never probably in a long run situation because as soon as you get there, it changes. So here's our full employment level of output. I told you that's our goal. So the ideal would be that we would be producing at this full employment level in the long run. So then we think about what could cause the aggregate supply curve to shift. What would cause it to shift to the right to increase aggregate supply or to the left to decrease aggregate supply? So the primary factors that we think of to shift aggregate supply is time. How much time do producers have to respond to changes in aggregate demand? Or a change in the per unit production cost. So remember, if an employer's production costs go up, that negatively affects their profit levels. So they'll begin to decrease aggregate supply. They'll begin to shift it to the left. What could cause per unit production costs to go up? Well, think about how an, a significant increase in minimum wage would affect employers, suppliers. If minimum wage goes up, is that a good thing or a bad thing from the perspective of suppliers, employers? Well, for them, it's bad, right? 
their labor costs are going to go up significantly if they use minimum wage labor. That will cause aggregate supply to shift to the left. It could be a supply shock like oil prices going right, way up. When oil prices go up, it has a domino effect all through our economy. Whether oil is directly used in the production of the good or service, like anything made out of plastic, or whether it's just uh, distribution and transportation costs. So there are some um, overarching things that affect all suppliers that could cause that per unit production cost to shift right or left. We'll also talk about changes in productivity. Okay, so remember, we're going to add on to our supply curves, but it doesn't change the overall effect. We were going to add the vertical region. <laughs> Just have trouble drawing that straight, don't I? And the horizontal region. But without doing that to each curve, you see the original curve, AS1, is something happens that is a positive thing from the producer's perspective, and it's overarching. It's not a single producer. It's the production of every good or service we produce in the economy then that causes them to increase their aggregate supply, shift it to the right. If something happens that negatively affects producers, then that causes them to decrease their production, to decrease the, the total aggregate supply of everything we produce. So that would shift the curve to the left. So then this just breaks down what we already talked about. It could be that the input prices, resource prices, factors of production, those all are synonyms. Inputs, resources, factors of production, all synonyms, they say the same thing. If the resource prices change, if they go up, is that a good thing or a bad thing for producers? It's bad, so that causes that aggregate supply curve to shift left. It really doesn't matter whether it's domestic or imported. If the prices are going up, it's bad for producers, shifts to the left. If the prices are going down, it's good for the producers, shifts it to the right. And then I told you we were going to talk about productivity. So I want you again to think about productivity from the producer's perspective. Do you want your employees to be more or less productive? Well, I want them to be more productive, right? Well, if our employees become more productive, we will shift our supply curve to the right. It will be more profitable for us to produce more. If something happens to decrease productivity, low morale, whatever the situation might be, illness, if something happens to decrease productivity, then the aggregate supply curve shifts to the left. So the way that we measure productivity, it's total output divided by total input. So if you think about measuring it strictly from a labor point of view, the input is how many people you have working and the output is how much product gets produced. So if we're a pizza maker, just to put it on a, a micro scale, just thinking about a single producer, if we're a pizza maker and we make 100 pizzas a day and we employ 10 people, then the productivity factor we'd be calculating is 100 divided by 10 would be 10. But if we got some new technology and it let our people be more productive, maybe we can make 200 pizzas a day with those same 10 people. So output would be 200 divided by 10, and now it's 20. So our productivity factor would have changed from 10 to 20. If productivity is increasing like that example, and that uh, can be applied on a much broader scale, not just pizza producers, but that technology perhaps had applicability in a lot of different industries, then the aggregate supply curve would be shifting to the right. So how do we measure that per unit production cost? It's that same idea, the total input cost, so that would be our total cost of our labor, divided by the total output. So just the input cost divided by the output will give us our total uh, per unit production cost. So legal and institutional environment, I didn't think to mention this one earlier when I was giving you an overview. If the government does something to change the, 
um, institute some sort of new law or policies, perhaps it's an environmental protection agency policy that affects businesses or changes business taxes that will also, sh also shift the supply curve right or left. So taxes, remember that's money from the business to the government. So if business taxes go up, is that good or bad from the perspective of the producers? Well, it would be bad, right? So if business taxes are going up, then aggregate supply is shifting left. But what about subsidies? Well, subsidies is money from the government to the business. So if our subsidies are going up, maybe a milk producer, maybe the milk industry, they get a lot of, a lot of agricultural products have a lot of subsidies. If subsidies are going up, then that's a good thing from the perspective of the producer and they shift their aggregate supply curve to the right producing more at all possible prices. If there's some new environment, environmental protection uh, procedures, laws, policies that businesses have to comply with, even though it's not profitable for them, that will begin to shift our aggregate supply curve to the left. And then we're ready to put both pieces together. We know all we need to know about aggregate demand. We know about aggregate supply. It's never helpful to graph just one of those on a graph. We need both of them on one graph because it's the interaction between buyers and sellers that actually give us information about the economy. So let's put both our demand curve and our supply curve on one graph. And we see that open circle, that intersection spot, that equilibrium and that will be our equilibrium price level and equilibrium output. So look at the schedule on the right. Notice that at that price level of 100, the real output demanded and the real output supplied is the same number. So that's our equilibrium. It doesn't say that that $510 billion level is the full employment level. So we can be at equilibrium and not be at full employment. We want to be at full employment, but we may have to increase aggregate demand or decrease aggregate demand or shift aggregate supply until we meet that full employment equilibrium. But here's our equilibrium at 510, whether that's full employment or not. They're wanting you to look at a disequilibrium spot, a spot where you're not in equilibrium. So they, they uh, gave us a, an example here at a price level of 92. Well, at a price level of 92, how much is being supplied? That 502. Mm -hmm. And how much is being demanded? 514. We know that at any price level, below the equilibrium price, we're going to get a, sh a shortage, meaning aggregate demand is going to be more than aggregate supply. So here we see that 514 minus that 502, we have a $12 billion shortage. We can interpret those exactly the same way we did in chapter three. Do you remember doing in chapter nine, demand pull and cost push inflation? This is the exact same demonstration. It's just that now you have some understanding of the aggregate demand and aggregate supply curves. So we'll see it here again. Okay, so we have this original equilibrium of AD1 with our aggregate supply curve. Here. And so our price level was P1. And look, it says we're at the full employment level. See the QF? We're at full employment level. Doesn't have to be, but it says we are. Then aggregate, aggregate demand increased, shifted to the right. So now we're at this 82 level up here. That is our demand pull inflation. Demand pull inflation was caused by excessive demand. Do you remember that? Let's see if I can get that written. 
Excessive demand. It's when the economy is doing great, it's overheated, people just have jobs, they have money, they're just working and spending and working and spending, and that's increasing that aggregate demand, and it increases faster than production levels can change. Notice the aggregate supply curve isn't shifting here. And so during that time period before aggregate supply can respond in that short run, fully respond, then it's driving that price level up. Here's our aggregate supply, aggregate demand curve. This time aggregate demand is shifting to the left. So we start out at this original equilibrium spot. And so at price level one and at full employment, something happens to cause people, households, businesses, government, net exports, some sector of the economy or more than one sector to decrease their spending, which shifts the aggregate demand curve to the left. Theory will tell us that prices will go from A to C. So price level goes down and we produce less, we're at Q2. But sometimes prices are sticky and when prices are sticky, production levels go down, but prices don't. Have you noticed that sometimes prices are downwardly inflexible, sticky, they don't go down like theory tells us that they will? There's a lot of reasons why producers are hesitant to lower their prices. So we might, in a leftward shift of aggregate demand, go through at least some time period of demand goes down, but prices don't. Eventually, prices will probably decline if the leftward shift in aggregate demand is long enough. So this slide shows us reasons why producers might not lower prices as the model predicts that they will. So prices are inflexible downward when producers don't expect that that leftward shift in aggregate demand is going to be a long-term shift because it's expensive to lower prices and they may not even be able to be lowered. So let's think about why. We used to see a lot of price wars. We don't see that so much anymore. We used to be able to drive by two gas stations across the street and one would lower their price and so the other would lower their price and so the other one would respond back and forth, a price war. With electronic information being so widely available, we don't see that happen much anymore. Airlines still do it to some extent. American Airlines and Southwest Airlines will sue them get in a tit for tat kind of situation, but again, it doesn't happen as often as it used to. Menu cost just reflects the actual cost it would take an employer to change his prices. That might be, that we call it menu because it might literally be reprinting a menu in a restaurant, but all businesses, if they change their prices, incur some cost. Just imagine changing all the inventory tags. About 80% of most businesses' cost is their labor cost. Now, that's just a generalization, but it's pretty accurate. And if we can't change the price of our labor, we probably can't change the price of the product or the service that we're producing. Whether it's because our labor is under contract, like faculty members at an academic institution or um, union contracts, if, if there's contractual labor costs, then we're not going to be able to lower our labor cost. We're probably not going to be able to lower our prices. Efficiency wages is the idea that there's a certain magical wage that we can pay our people that will get the most productivity from them. And there's a lot of research that businesses do to find that efficiency wage. What is it that I can pay my people that won't bankrupt me and yet we'll get the greatest productivity from them. If I have found my efficiency wage, I'm not real inclined to change it. And if I don't change my wages, I can't change the price. And then of course we can't pay people lower than minimum wage. Just a global perspective, 
It's the difference in between actual and potential GDP. So when you see the negative side, you would be expecting some cyclical unemployment in those nations. So we looked at demand pull inflation again. Here's another look at cost push inflation, which hopefully you remember was a leftward shift in ag supply. What caused cost push inflation? Do you remember? So cost push inflation is always caused by an increase in per unit production cost. So an increase in production cost. Per unit, meaning every unit we produce cost more than it used to. Increase in per unit production cost. I know, you think I'm the slowest ever riding with this mouse. And I am. So a leftward shift in our aggregate supply curve pushes up price level. We knew that. It's called inflation. So we knew the price level was going up. But I really want you to notice what's happening to GDP. When we increased the aggregate demand curve, prices went up, but we also increased GDP. But if we have inflation that's caused by increases in the per unit production cost and so shifts our aggregate supply curve left, prices go up. But GDP goes down. Notice we're no longer at full employment. Well, that's a sad situation. I want you to think about that. People are losing their jobs and things are costing more. It's, it's much harder to recover from cost push inflation than it is from demand pull because cost push inflation is going to end in recession. Remember, a recession is any level of production of GDP that's below that full employment. So the decrease in aggregate supply is causing us to produce less. So GDP is going down. So when GDP goes down, we define that as a recession. So we have an increase in ag demand. There's our aggregate supply. Price level would be going up. But look what could happen if at the same time we have the increase in aggregate demand, if we could also increase aggregate supply, we could get an even further increase in GDP but mitigate the inflation. So let me say that again. I know it's hard to see all that come at the same time. As start out at AS1, AD1, see the original equilibrium at A, that's where we were, then aggregate demand increase pushing us to B, that gave us more GDP but really higher prices. If the government could do something when we have those increases in aggregate demand to also increase aggregate supply, we'd get even more GDP, woohoo, more stuff, but we'd get it at a much lower price level. So the goal as aggregate demand is shifting to the right is for the government to also be helping aggregate supply shift to the right as well. So we're really finished with this chapter. This last word in this edition of the textbook is focused on the Great Recession of 2007, 8, 9. And as I record this, I'm thinking that might not be the recession that you'll be thinking of as you're listening to this in the future. But in 2007, 8, 9, we went into that deep recession, primarily caused by, well, triggered at least by the collapse in home prices because of some bad lending um, procedures. The Federal Reserve responded with changes in monetary policy that lowered interest rates really to almost zero for a long, long time that would get people spending, right? Lower interest rates, people buy more houses, cars, et cetera. Businesses buy more capital equipment. That should move that aggregate demand to the right, which is what we definitely needed. And then we also got huge increases in fiscal policy with government spending increasing again and again and again with different stimulus packages um, directly into households and businesses to try to shift that aggregate demand curve to the right. 
All of that changes in monetary policy and fiscal policy to try to alleviate the effects of that recession and get that aggregate demand curve to shift to the right didn't have as large effect as we were hoping. The GDP growth was slow, but it was steady for a long time. So it doesn't always happen right away. It happens over time. We will see that same response and effect in other recessions that we encounter.